Hey, hey everybody, welcome on in to ClayShare Live. I am Jessica Putnam Phillips, the founder of ClayShare, and tonight, oh my goodness, do I have something fun planned for you? We're gonna be glazing some ceramic beads or ceramic pendants, depending on how you're using your bead, kind of like the one I'm wearing right now. So this whole week on ClayShare, it's bead week. This whole week, a week of bead awesomeness. And we have got to celebrate with three new classes. One came out yesterday. That's making a textured chunky bead. You can go watch that class right now. Well, don't go right now. Wait till after this. So I'm gonna teach you how to make these in that class, these textured chunky beads. And you can turn them into pendants by themselves or use them as a bead accent. So I'll be glazing some of those. As you can tell, I've got a basket of beads right here. And then tomorrow we have another bead class. It's the cannoli bead. I, I love this bead. Oh my goodness. Let me just give you a, a peek, a sneaky peeky at this one right here. Um, so I'll show you that in tomorrow's class. And then on Friday, saving the best for last, the teardrop pendant. And I've got a bunch of them here that still need glazing. So in all of the bead classes that I have this week is they, show you how to make the bead, I show you how to glaze the bead, how to fire the bead, and then the finished result. So that's a whole complete circle. It's not a class where I'm gonna show you how to make a bead and then send you on your own, good luck, have fun figuring the rest out. No, I show you the whole thing. I even show you how to glaze them, but I thought it would be fun to do a little bead glazing tutorial because you might be making beads on your own and you might struggle with the glazing part. So I thought I'd make it, make it a little easy. So hi everybody, welcome, welcome, welcome. See everybody's tuning in. We got folks on Instagram, we got the folks on clayshare.com, folks on YouTube, folks on Facebook, folks on Apple TV, Amazon Fire TV, on Roku, Vimeo.com, you're all there. Hi folks, welcome on in. So this is a fun kind of um, sister class for all of the bead classes. And if you want more, jewelry classes, well, I have got an aromatherapy pendant class. So if you ever wanted to know more about aromatherapy, because I explain different scents, different essential oils that you should use for aromatherapy and how to use that in that class. I also have a textured pendant class that's this one right here. So you can learn how to make one of these. And then I have a super duper cute earring. Make your own clay earrings. So here's some little ones. I've got some bigger ones here, so I basically give you the start and you run with it. Aren't these, I should have worn these tonight. These are super cute. And, because if you're gonna make all this jewelry, you need to have a place to put this jewelry. Uh, this earring holder right here, I show you how to make one of these in the earring holder class. Also have a class on making your own bead tree, because you gotta fire all these beads, right? So I have a class on that that'll help you with that. I think that's all I have right now for jewelry classes, but there might be extras hidden in there that um, I can't think of right now. So beads have been your nemesis for years. Anxious to hear what I have to say. So Bonnie, did you watch the new textured chunky bead class? Because I have to tell you, if you haven't yet, that is bead making 101. It's the easiest way to make a textured bead that looks professional and is just Super cute. Here's one that I had from the class. Show the folks on Instagram. Look how cute that bead is. And you guys can see it too. So this is one from the class. Plus, well, I've got a few more. They all, I mean, they all look, they all look pretty spectacular. And so I really like to put a lot of texture in my beads. You don't have to, but I figure it's nice to have all of that change in surface to catch our glazes. So if we're gonna put texture in our beads, we wanna make sure the glazes we use are gonna work with all that texture, right? So you wanna look at translucent glazes, um, like transparent glazes, the Celadon line from Amico or traditional Celadon is great as well. My Oribe, a lot of, um, a lot of people like to use the Potter's Choice line. The, 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 this is one of those, I love that. It's a really pretty bead. And you can also stain them with either underglaze or an interactive pigment or an oxide and then put a glaze on top and then that creates this depth and it, it catches the texture and really highlights it. That's what I did with this one here. So let me show you guys. So this 
the one I'm showing the folks on Instagram is Autumn Foliage. The other dark one is Indigo. These are from Georgie Ceramic. Let me get this one for you. Look at that bead. It's, this one's gorgeous. I don't know if you can, folks on Instagram are getting the view. If you guys can get the view, are you seeing that? It's metallic, it's beautiful. I love it, it's fabulous. So yeah, so we have a new jewelry category. If you go to clayshare.com or are watching on the app, scroll down and all these jewelry classes will appear there. The textured chunky bead was out yesterday and then we have one tomorrow, one Friday. So bead week. So let's grab some beads. Now these are all beads I made using my own stamps that I made. And you remember a few months ago, we made stamps together. So all the stamps we made together are the ones I used to make these beads because I figure if we're gonna have a bead making class, you know, I wanna make it so that it's approachable and easy and you can make your own texture. Now some of these I did like this one here with my rolling pin design, my, my vintage geometric design. So that's one of my rolling pins and you can use those. And then this spiral bead, I, I love these spirals. They're one of my favorite things right now. This one, I think will come down a little bit more. Get you in so you can see that. Is that, is that focused? So you can see that this bead right here is phenomenal. And then this is a stamp too. So these are all just stamps. So you just make some stamps, make your own stamps. And then after you make stamps, make beads. Easy peasy. And so these fired to cone five. And Peggy says she watched the new bead class. It's wonderful. She loves making beads. She has a ton of bisque beads sitting around your studio. So now you're going to glaze. So let's go ahead and start with glazing. I look at my patterns and I like to think what they're evoking. So for me, this spiral always, I think of the ocean. I think of seashells. So I go with either blues or green tones or the same colors you might find a seashell. Like you could do this in a beautiful like Mako Abalone. You could use that glaze and then put mother of pearl luster on top and it would be like a seashell. It would be fab fabulous. Maybe we'll do that. I might do that with that one. We'll save that out. This little leaf. Here, I'm going to want to do this in probably a green or brown tone, but you don't have to. You know, I did some here using the hibiscus chino from Amico with this stamp here. I, I love it. I love the color of that one. So, you know, think about what you wear and what you're going to wear your bead with and glaze it in colors that will match your clothes or maybe contrast your clothes. Or if you plan to sell them, colors that you throw, and, and do a variety of colors. So let's start with, we'll do pigments and wiping back first, and then we will do just glazing. What is the dark color, colored glaze on that bead? Which one are you asking, Amy? The blue one here? This is from the class, I show it, but this one here is Georgie's Indigo Interactive Pigment. And then I put their translucent satin on top of that. So that's what this dark colored bead is here. If it's that blue one, if not, tell me what color and I will help you with that. All right, so I'm gonna open up the Georgie's Autumn Foliage Interactive Pigments. If you're not familiar with Georgie's Interactive Pigments, let me grab my pigment board. I did a class on making a Testile board using Georgie's interactive pigments and here it is Sadly the other day it fell over and two of them fell off and broke so I got to remake two of them But this is what you get when you get the Georgie's interactive pigment set Like if you get the, the little sample set that they sell you get all these except the bottom row is my chun blue and The top row is their translucent satin, but you get the glazes in here and all the pigments so you can make a wide array of colors just from that one sample set and because it's jewelry it's small you don't need a lot of glaze or pigment so i like to use this as a guide the autumn foliage line is everything right here in this column so this one is autumn foliage with just clear on top and so you can see how that will make the see how that makes the texture pop on that it really does so I can see what all these glazes will look like. This one lives down here with autumn foliage. So I'm going to use autumn foliage now 
And I believe I'm going to go with this top one, which is the satin. So we're going to use the satin on the autumn foliage. So I'm just going to set this to the side. I need to mount this somewhere so it's not prone to getting knocked over. So with these pigments, when you go to use them, you're going to want to wear gloves because they are made of oxides and they're pretty strong. I'm just going to quickly do a bead for you all. So I would normally throw on gloves for this. And you thin them down about half water, half pigment. This jar I've been working out of for a while, so I, I thin it down in the jar. So it's already pre-thinned half and half. It's not straight. You don't want to use them straight. Um, they're really concentrated if you do. And I can promise you once being, just brushing this on my hands today will not hurt me. It'll be fine. But I wouldn't want to do this over and over, like for years. That's when you run into problems. So I painted the entire thing with the pigment. And I know it looks black, but it's actually, um, it's got, it's got browns and greens and sometimes blues happening in there, although it doesn't look it. Now, we don't have to worry about food safety because this isn't food. Although, you always want to think about if you want glazes that are not food safe in your studio. Doesn't mean they'll necessarily hurt you or you can't use them. It's just not the best glazes for food, right? So I try not to have any glazes that are not food safe just so that I don't accidentally use something on a bead, then use it on food wear. All right, so if you aren't familiar with Georgie's ceramic, go to georgies.com. Write that down for later. Go to georgies.com and you can find out more about their, their interactive pigment set. But I'm just gonna wipe back the excess and It'll look like I'm wiping a lot away, but in fact, a lot is staying. Because the clay is porous, it's been bisque fired, so it's already absorbed a lot of these pigments. So I'm just gonna keep wiping. And the thing is, for something like this bead, if I wanted it to be heavily pigmented, I could just brush on the pigment and not remove it. But I want it lightly pigmented. Now for this one, the indigo that I have, I brushed it on straight, so that didn't, I didn't wipe that back. I left it heavy. Because I really wanted to make this deep, dark, blue, metallic-y bead. Um, great for denim, you know, be perfect with what I'm wearing today. It's blue. Blue is a neutral in jewelry. You can wear blue jewelry with anything, you know. And if you have blue eyes, forget it. If you have blue eyes, you can always wear blue jewelry. So think about that. Um, whatever color eyes you have, you can match your jewelry to your eyes. It always looks amazing. So if people are like, but the, that, that glaze, those earrings don't match. And you'd be like, they match my eyes. That's what matters. All right, so once you get your pigment on there, you want to let it set. Um, just a little bit for it to dry. And then I have their translucent satin. I'm gonna open it up on top, over my bucket, because if not, little flakes of glaze get everywhere. So what should the consistency of Georgie's eggshell wash be? Yours is quite thick and goes on chalky. So Debbie, it sounds like your eggshell wash is a little too thick. Add some water and thin it down. You want the consistency of, of yogurt, sour cream, somewhere in there. You want it to go on smooth enough that it's not like the chalkiness and not clumpy. So mix it up, add a little more water, and try it again. I usually only put two coats of the eggshell wash on everything I make. Three coats is a little too much for me. It gets too opaque. All right, so now that we've gone ahead and pigmented this, we wanna glaze it, but I, I'm not gonna be able to hold this and glaze it because I'm holding it, right? And then I'm turning my fingers and I'm getting glaze everywhere. So you don't want that. So I got these bamboo kebab sticks. We used these in the class when we made the textured beads, so you all know about these. You could also pick yourself up bamboo skewers or these little lollipop sticks. These are all great things. And what I like to do is I will put my bead through the stick. 
So now my bead's on something, I can hold it, and I don't have to worry about touching the glaze or smearing it at all. And if you need to, what I will often do to support it is I'll just grab a couple jars that I have floating around the studio of glaze, and I'll just rest it on there like that. So that will hold it for me so I don't have to actually hold it myself. Makes it easier. Uh, I will show you, I did use some, so I did use some kind of bead rack as I, in the bead classes, I show you my bead rack. You get to see my, my rack in the class. Um, I also have a class that teaches you how to make your own bead rack or bead tree for firing. So if you're a DIYer, like I am, and you want to make your own bead tree or bead rack, you can do that. Um, you can also buy this really fabulous one I'll show you in a minute from Clayscapes Pottery. All right, so I've got the translucent satin on the brush, and I'm just going to dab it on. Um, we were talking about thickness a minute ago. Let me show you how thick my translucent satin is. This is actually a little thinner than I think Georgie's wants us to have it, like they would probably recommend. Can you all see that in the, mm -hmm. in the overhead? Um, you see the consistency of that? This is how I like my Georgie's satins, clears, and the eggshell wash. So, um, is that, that's a very thin yogurt. Like once you stir yogurt up, it would be really a thin yogurt. Well, hello, watching in from California, next to, next to Berkeley, loving the demos. I'm glad you're here with us and hanging out and learning a bit and just having a good time, right? And so I'm just gonna dab this on. See, I'm not even touching my bead and I can get glaze on the little bamboo skewer, it doesn't matter. Now for the one that I was showing earlier, I only had one thickish coat on there. We'll put two, two thin coats. I would rather have two thin coats of a glaze than one thick coat. You get better coverage. You can fill in any areas you missed when you do that second coat. So I personally would rather do two thin than one thick. All right, so there's the bead glazed. It's very exciting stuff at this stage. And now it has to dry before we can fire it. So I'm gonna sit this to the side and we'll glaze another bead. Let's put that over there. Let's go for a bigger bead. Let's pick something, what do I got out? Let's do something fun and funky. This one's, I love this one. Two stamps, just two different stamps to make that. So I, ooh, look at that. Ooh, boom. <laughs> it's coming, the bead's coming for you. <laughs> I love it. So this one is a really lovely chunky bead. Um, anybody out there with uh, hazel or brown eyes? I think we could do something really amazing if you have um, eyes that color. You know, you could do something like this hibiscus. I know it's got rose undertones and golds and everything, but can you imagine how that will bring out the gold flecks in eyes? It's also a great color on skin tones. Every skin tone loves hibiscus gloss. Um, you know, it's just, it's, it's, a, it's, a great, it's a great color. So if you're looking at a loss for a bead, go for the hibiscus gloss. That's one of my faves. So maybe we'll do that one. Did I grab that? I don't know if I have it. I have hibiscus matte. I don't have my hibiscus gloss. Maybe I can get a helper to grab me hibiscus gloss out of the chinos. Probably to, yeah, you know where. All right, so we're gonna do the same thing. We're gonna grab, see what I got here. I have aqua, poppy. Either of these would be really great for a bead. Um, an amber, uh, Amico has a textured amber. Clayscapes has a gorgeous amber color. Uh, let me show you right here. This would make, this amber would make a gorgeous bead right here. Would be fabulous. So beads, if you're gonna make jewelry, you can use the beads as your test tiles, but I, I highly recommend you do some experimentation first and actually make a test tile board like the Georgie's one I showed. I also got another one. So wait, I'm gonna grab the other one. Um, this is one using my own studio glazes as well as Amico's Potter's Choice glazes. So the top here are Amico's Potter's Choice glazes. And then, let's see, I think, 
getting to the end. And then this is my chun right here. So starting here are my own studio, my own personal recipes that I developed of my own studio glazes right through all the way down, do, 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 all these rows until we get to, oh, that's still mine. Is this one mine too? Till this one. So this aqua is the celadon line down here. So from this one to this one, these are all my own recipes that I've developed myself through testing over 20 years of making pottery. That's what you do, right? So I've got my glazes I could choose from, or I can go with some lovely Amico glazes. These are my favorites for beads. These are the colors I have found that work really well on jewelry. They work great together and they work great on most people's skin tones, which is important and with clothes because we wear clothes and we want our jewelry to match our clothes. Funny, funny, I know. Um, a really great one is Salt Buff. We could do a whole, we could just talk about just the Potter's Choice ones I have here. Um, textured Turquoise, I adore. That is a great one. And if you do beads out of dark clay, Oh my goodness, textured turquoise on dark clay. Yeah, it's pretty fabulous. So you make yourself a little tile board, like the Georgie's one that I showed a little while ago, or this one, where they're just little tiny tiles, they don't take up much space, easy to make. And the fact is, now I have this great visual reference. So I have classes on making your own test tiles. I have classes on making that board that I showed you. And you should do that if you haven't, if you're just starting pottery. Also, you know, if you wanna see on little dishes, these are my Georgie's Interactive Pigment dish test, test plates. So I can do one pigment with multiple glazes on top. So you can see that. So these are, and then uh, one of our Clay Share workshop instructors Maria Sampson has a fabulous workshop making whimsical garden stacks. And she has this great flower um, test tile maker. You all know I'm talking about. This is my version. It's not the same. I'll put it up for the, the lighting is, is not great on the overhead. Um, but it's a great way to test the pigments and the colors. So anyhow, make some tests first, then you have an idea of what your glazes are gonna look like, so you're not just flying blind. I mean, I'll give you suggestions here, but it's always good to have your own information in your own studio. So let me grab my brushes. I didn't talk about brushes. You can use any brush, any brush you want. Um, I like these Sumi, S-U-M-I. Uh, they're also called bamboo handle brushes. Japanese or Chinese calligraphy brushes. Uh, you could use some little just regular painting brushes, you know, like this is a quarter inch flat brush. Right here is a number, I think this is an eight, number eight round brush. That's a great one. So if you're in the hobby store and you wanna pick up a brush and you can't find the Sumi, a number eight round is a good go-to because it holds a lot of glaze and it comes to a nice point. So it's a good one. What is the glaze on the blue on the blue and silver triangle shaped? I need more info than that. That's not enough for me. Triangle shaped what? Is it a bead? Is it a test tile? I'll, I'll happily tell you. Um, but I need a little more info, hon. All right. Bead, bead racks and trees are on the Clayscapes Pottery website, clayscapespottery.com. I will show you my bead rack. You're all just hanging out, so because uh, I'm told you I'm going to show you my rack. Why does there have to be innuendo? Why? Why? All right, so I'm blobbing this on. This hibiscus gloss has that lovely warm rose color. Um, it also has like tans and mauvey, and it breaks over texture really nicely. So I'm going to get some good stuff. And that's just one glaze. Not having to do two glazes, just one glaze. I like that when a single glaze can do a lot of work for me and I don't have to go back and put a second color on. I mean, I do like to layer them, but sometimes it's nice, just one. And then after 
this glaze has dried and it's dried on the bamboo skewer, I wipe my bamboo skewers clean. You don't want them to, you don't want them to get gunky, right? So you wipe it clean after you're done. So you clean it up. So this is going to dry. We're just going to hang it here. And then I'm going to grab the first bead we did. And I'll just put it over there. And I'll show you my bead tree. I'll show you my bead rack. So things you fire beads on are called bead trees or bead racks. Trees because they have little things sticking off them like branches. But they don't really look like a tree, so it might not make sense. So this is my bead tree slash bead rack that I have. Um, Clayscapes Pottery sells them. Now you can make your own. You can make your own very simply with some nichrome rods. So that's nickel chromium. That's what this is here. And it's made of a high temp material that can fire to, this one goes to cone 5, 6, but you can get it all the way up to cone 10, 11, or 12, depending on the rating. So when you're buying your nichrome rods or wire, check to make sure what the rating is for firing temperature. It should be on there. And cone 5 is 2167 Fahrenheit, just so you know. And you want to have rods or wires that will at least go to that. So all you do is you take and place your little bead tower parts in the kiln and then you thread your beads. We're just going to thread a few on a rod and you put it on. Now let's talk about, I have a whole class. Did we put that class up where I show people how to do the bead tree or is that this going to be a separate thing? We got to put that up. So I, I'll put that up um, maybe after this, we'll see if we can get that up for you guys. But it's a separate little video on how to use a bead tree. And so when you look at it, you might think, I'm basically going to give you the class right now, right? So you might think you want to do this. And, and then, oh, look at all that space. Oh my gosh, I can just stick all these beads. It's like making a shish kebab. Just keep going. Stick all your beads on there. Keep going. More and more beads, right? Stuff them all on there. Well. You gotta space them out, yes, because if they're stuck together, they're gonna glaze together and you're gonna get a crazy, cool, little sculptural thing. You can maybe do something with it. So you need to space them out so they can't touch each other, right? But the problem we're having is we have too much of a span and what will happen is as this rod heats up and everything softens, it's gonna sag on you. As it sags, your beads are gonna slide together and stick. So you need to Stop, calm down, don't put so many beads on a rod. Go ahead and scooch them together so that you have about half the rod's length on the inside and quarter of the length on the outside, right? So you can put three beads there nicely and a bead here and a bead here. Yes, you cannot get as many beads on as you would if you shoved them all together. But if you shove them all together and then they bend the rod and stick, you've just ruined all your beads. So you're not winning in any way at all doing that. So, you know, what you're going to do is then do another layer. So you put your beads after they're glazed on and then you set them on here and you do the same thing go all the way down. And this is double sided, mind you. So I don't know if you can see, it goes all the way down the back and all the way down the front and you fill it up with beads and I can get five on a rack. So five, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30 beads, maybe could get another six, probably could get 35 beads on the rack in one single firing, which is a lot of beads. So if you're using a different bead, like this bead that I call the cannoli bead and that class is coming out tomorrow, I think you'd be safe to do two beads in the center on this one and then get your spacing correct. You could do one on each end and you'll be fine if you do it like that. And that will give you four per rod and there's six rods. So four, eight, 12, 16, 20, 24, right? With our math. So you could put 24 of those cannoli beads on here. Now other ways you can fire is if you just have the rods and you have kiln posts, and you all know if you fire a kiln, you know what posts are, you could span these on the posts and just put your beads on and use the posts. And I show you how to do that in that DIY bead tree. 
Another option is you can take a soft kiln brick and insert wire or rods into it and make your own, but that works best for smaller beads, not big chunky beads like these. So, so could you not use three racks and separate into thirds? I mean, you could separate how you, how you want to. Okay, so Drew says these rods are nine gauge. That's what size they are. So could you put them in here on thirds? You can, but let's, let's talk about that same issue we had. Too much span in the middle, too much span on the end, you're going to sag here. Here's the thing. Look at this. Let's do, a, let's, let's do a little engineering. Structural engineering time. Bet you didn't know I did structural engineering. I didn't. Not at all. But we're going to pretend I'm an engineer because this is true. So we have this span here, right? And it's being supported on each side by these pillars. So we look at this span and basically half is for this side, half is this side, and that's the support. So really it's only a, a space this wide that this is supporting. So let's go over here. We're asking this span to support this rod here. That's too, that's too big. That's way too big. You put a bead on it, maybe if it's a tiny little light bead, you would be okay. But you put a, a couple heavy beads, that's going to sag. So what you're going to end up with, instead of a nice straight rod, you're going to have this flexing down on the side, and you don't want that. So I like to spread it out so that the, the span is equal that this is carrying. And I did tell you I'm not a structural engineer. Don't ask me to build bridges. I can't do that. But I can ID them. Anyhow, that's another story for another life, right? All right, so I would do them approximately like a little more out. This right here. And you put your beads on it. You fire it. Again, you put your towers in the kiln first. Load your beads up. Start with the bottom and work your way up on each side. And then go. Then just fire it. When you're done, what will happen is because there's glaze on the inside of your bead. It, it might stick a little. If you do, you just twist it off and it comes off and it's not a problem. And that's it. When you first get these rods, they're nice and shiny. When you fire them, they turn this lovely carbon finish, um, kind of a matte finish, which isn't bad. It's just what happens when you fire them. So how do you test the wire rods to find out what cone they go to? Michelle, when you purchase them, it will say, um, the only way you could test is to fire them until they bend and then are no longer usable. So you want to make sure when you purchase them, you read all the information on the packaging that the, wherever you're getting them from, your supplier puts out there. I do know these from Clayscapes Pottery go to cone five slash six. Well, they go to six in their studio. They go to five in mine, because that's what I fire. So this is what I do when I have a bead that needs to hang. The other option is, and I don't have any kiln stilts here, is if you make a big bead, kind of like this here, I fired it on a kiln stilt, which is a three-prong little, um, made of a ceramic material, refractory ceramic material that has the little nichrome rods in it, and it just supports it like that in the kiln. And then when you pop it off, you might have three little bumps, you just sand them lightly, and it's fine. So you can glaze the back of things. Your other option, don't even put glaze on it at all. Just leave them bare like I did with these teardrop pendants. So you don't have to glaze them if you don't want to. You just leave them nude, in the nude. And then you just fire them like this on your kiln shelf. So honestly, if you sand this down, and especially if you use a dark clay, it's going to look amazing. So you're not going to have any issues at all. You bent one of your wires when you hung spoons on it and you space the towers too far apart. Yes, so you'll have to get a new wire. It happens. You need to make sure that the spacing is right because if you're asking that to carry too much weight, it will sag. It's just, it's like bridges. <laughs> oh, I keep saying that. <laughs> and Michelle, you got yours used. Uh, buying used nichrome wire and bead trees I would safely say you can use it as low fi at low fire. You can test it at cone 5-6 with a piece you are not in love with, but it might, it might all melt and, and you might ha have all your wire sagged. Then you know it was low fire, but now it's no good to you. So you have to buy a new one. So you got some choices. 
You can use it for low fire only and buy yourself a new one that you know goes to cone 5.6, or you can test it and ruin it and still buy a new one that you know goes to cone 5, cone 6. And you can use the cone 5, 6 ones at low temperature too. Yeah, if it's, if it's used, I would not, unless you know for sure from the person or you can see on the packaging the manufacturer's information and find their website and find the product and find out there what it goes to, I, I would then not risk um, firing it with hot, like hotter than low fire. All right, we're going to do more textures. More texture time. Here's another chunky bead. Ooh, that's a fun one. I don't know what I, I used this, I used the back of a brush for the back. I'm not sure why. Um, I guess I wanted to press it in. But we're going to do some more staining. And I thought we would stain with some underglaze. So we're going to use the cherry, actually no, no, we're going to use the cherry blossom and we're going to use the carmine. So the carmine is from Speedball Art and they make underglazes. They also make a great cone 5-6 clear glaze. I love it. I love it to pieces. Can you reuse the wires if they were bent during firing? Um, you could bend them back, but what's happened is the integrity of that wire is failing and it's going to probably keep bending and eventually it's going to break. They have a life span. They don't live forever. These wires will wear out. So while the towers should last you always, the wires will wear out. They become brittle the more you fire them and then they break or they sag and break. So what will happen is you'll notice um, flaking and stuff happening to your wire after many, many uses and you'll have to replace it. That's, that's a normal thing, um, you know, having to replace the wires. Okay, so I'm using Speedball Carmine under glaze. I just dipped it in and then I dipped my brush in water because I really want to have this more like a stain. So that's why I'm reaching over there to my bucket. I don't know if y'all can see. I got my, my water bucket off to the side. Um, here's a little note to self. <laughs> when you are staining anything, move everything out of the vicinity of like two feet in a circle because you'll flick bits of whatever you're staining with all over like I did on my work surface here and that will get in to all your little beads you might not want that that particular stain on. So I'm not wearing gloves with the speedball or underglazes. They are non-toxic. They are completely fine. I'm not going to expose myself to anything by holding this and getting this material on my bare skin. There's nothing in it that's going to hurt me. So unlike pigments where you do need to wear gloves of some sort, the underglazes from Speedball are non-toxic, so you don't have to. Drew, folks can't find the bead tree or bead rack on Clayscape's Pottery. Where do they go to find it? You don't think it's up right now. Mm -hmm. Drew is driving mm -hmm. in a car. <laughs> what are you doing in a car? We're doing a broadcast. All right, so here's the carmine on here. And I'm just going to wipe back on the sides, on the back, and then on the front. We're going to put a pink celadon glaze on top of this. So what I'm going to get is I'm going to have this darker, um, it'll be pinkish red stain on the recessed areas and then the proud areas, the raised areas, are going to be this beautiful cherry blossom pink. So it's a nice way to do pink on pink. If you like pink. Okay. I think, I mean, all by itself with a clear glaze, you just get a red and white. Well, this is a cream, but you'd get that finish. See that texture? Love it. All right, let's go ahead. Drew says everybody looking for the bee tree email. <laughs> okay, everybody email Andrew at clayscapespottery.com about the bead tree. He will get it for you. Uh, he's in a car driving. He can't help you right now. <laughs> I don't know if I warned him I was going to show the bead tree tonight. I don't think I did. So this is my cherry blossom glaze. Amico glazes, they are usually pretty chunky. They are very thick. Um, very thick. Can you see? 
Uh, look at that. <laughs> look how chunky it is. So we're doing chunky beads. Now, um, you could put some Garvan 7 in here. Isn't that what we're talking about putting in there to help it? I think that's what they were talking about. We had Diana Ferris on from Amico, and she was telling us about that during Clay Share Day, which if you didn't watch Clay Share Day, holy cats, go watch Clay Share Day. It was a full day of demos, tutorials. We gave stuff away. We had some great one-day deals. Sadly, they were one-day deals, so they're gone, but um, they're pretty awesome. We do always have deals with some of our sponsors, and if you go to claysharesources.com, you can see our sponsor offers. How do you like that for a little plug? <laughs> so I'm just blobbing this cherry blossom on all the way around. And this will be a nice pretty light bead that you could use for a bracelet or this could be a little pendant by itself. And I'm going to let this dry all the way and I'm going to come back in with a second coat because the cherry blossom really needs two coats. If you use the Amico Celadons and you're not getting the colors you want to get, like, let me get my board again. We need to see this. Okay, so these, and I think I'm going to put it up to the front camera. Starting here are Amico Celadons. So the Amico Celadons, you see how bright they are? If you are not getting, if your lavender celadon, if your Amico Lavender Celadon is not coming out this purple, you're firing it too hot and you don't have enough coats. Right here on the very end is three coats fired to cone five. That's how you get the purpley purple. Um, if your Cherry Blossom, which is a beautiful pink color that we're using right now, that's the Cherry Blossom. If you are not getting this, you're firing it too hot. So you need to come down to cone five and you need to have three solid coats and then here's the rest and then we have some others. But you need to go cone five with the celadons. They are picky. You can take them to cone six, but your lavender is going to go gray and your pink will burn out so it'll be more pinky clear. It won't be that beautiful cherry blossom color. Also, the brighter clay you use it on those, the better. The celadons don't really work on dark clays. They like a bee mix or a porcelain. They love porcelain. So that's another thing, knowing your, your glazes. All right, so that's sat. Let's go ahead and put a second coat on. I'm going to blob this on. Talking about everything tonight, aren't we? I covered my mic. <laughs> Sorry about that. It probably made a horrible racket. I've been getting um, my uh, producer has been after me lately because I've been abusing my mic. Filming for f over four years of filming classes and live broadcasts all day, every day. You think I would uh, know better after all that time. For some reason, lately, I've just started beating on my mics. Sorry, there goes the uh, audio visual budget because you got to keep buying new mics because I keep destroying them. So that was two coats of that cherry blossom. I'm going to let it dry and I am going to go in for a third. You saw how good three coats looks, right? You saw. I mean, you don't even see the texture anymore. I had to put it above. You don't even see the texture. The glaze fills it in, but it will come back. I promise it'll come back when we fire it. So let's put this off to the side. We're going to go in with another glaze. So what's the size of those test tiles, those little teeny eensy beensy ones? Um, I can measure one for you. These I just made, rolled out a slab of clay. Um, put a yardstick across it and just started cutting and then cut them into bits. So these have been fired, so they've shrunk 12%. Keep that in mind. So currently they are one and a half inches, add 12% to one and a half inches. And this one is one and a quarter inches. So add 12% to one and a quarter inches and you'll get what they were when I started. So they were, and I made them all at the same time to fit this board knowing I was gonna put a certain amount of test tiles on that board and spacing and everything for that. But that's what we talked about in my test tile class. All right, more, more beads, more bead time. Let's get more. Now, if you use an opaque glaze, what's gonna happen? Well, an opaque glaze, they're gorgeous and I do love them, but if you have texture, your opaque glaze is gonna hide your texture. And then 
sadly, um, you know, it's not really going to show. Let's do one where we layer two colors on top. And so the pendant that I'm wearing right now, um, which is around my neck, I'm showing the Instagram folks. Can you see the blue? Can, can I, let me see if I can come in. Can I get, hi everybody. Look at that. You see the blue? So this is Amico Obsidian two coats and then Amico Indigo Float two coats. And it, you really get that beautiful um, celestial blue on black, like night sky thing going on. And it's really gorgeous. So I thought we would do a bead with that. Um, and I'm sticking with the small texture beads, but you know. Ooh, let's do this one. That's a nice swirly one. And can the beads on the bead tree drip onto the beads below? No, well, could they theoretically? And can it happen in this world we live in? Of course, that could happen. But they haven't yet for me. And I'm not, I mean, look at the size of the rods and the size of the beads I'm using. They, they work together. If I was doing a bead this big, like the size of my fist, you might want to reconsider why you're making beads that big, but I think she's talking about glaze dripping off of oh glaze, oh not the not the rod sagging. Um, okay, so we'll change gears. Um, it's never happened to me. You don't put so much glaze on your beads. The Amico Potter, the Amico Celadons don't run. They're a very stable glaze. So if you are looking for a glaze that won't like run and melt by itself, the Amico Celadon line is very stiff. It's called a stiff glaze. It stays put. It doesn't run when you put it on. So three coats of this, I'm not worried. Um, Potter's Choice glazes, they do run a little more, but I'm only doing two coats, so I'm not really worried. Um, but again, it's not like we're doing six coats of color. Sorry, I thought you were talking about what happens if you put like the beads on the rack and yeah, it'll droop down. Yes, it would. If you put beads that are too heavy, it would droop down. That's a whole nother thing. So how do you know if we fired it too high? I mean, you never fired a celadon. How do you know if it's not quite right? So what temperature do you fire your kiln to? And, and I'm talking specifically to Amico's Celadon line of glazes, not other companies, Amico's Celadon line. If you're using one of them, like this right here, the Obsidian, it's a Celadon, and mostly the light colors, what happens is the hotter you go, those colors will burn out. That's what's happening. So did you fire the lavender celadon and did it come out gray? If the answer is yes, then you fired it too hot. If the answer is no, then you're perfect, right? Um, if you're not firing your kilns and other people are doing it, ask them what temperature they're firing your pieces to so you know. All the time I see people will buy the lavender celadon They'll fire a beautiful plate and it will come back gray and they're really upset that it's not purple. And it's because they fired too hot. So that's, that's just something to keep in mind. All right, we're gonna use a little bead holder, the little bamboo bead holder, and I'm gonna blob on the glaze. And we'll do two coats of this, but not two thick coats. You don't need two thick coats. Not for this one, because we're going for a different effect. So that one coat on there. I bet we can go back to, we can go to another bead while this one dries. Let me just set this off to the side. Did you guys like seeing how to stain things? I like staining things too. I'm gonna stain something else. We're gonna stain this. And I'm gonna stain it with, what do we got over here? Ooh, <laughs> I got a whole bin of stuff to stain. All right, I have the Georgie's. When you get the interactive pigment like sample kit, you get your jars, they're this big. So you have samples of the pigments. And it seems like you're not getting a lot, but I have to tell you, I've had this sample set for like four or five years. Ooh, winter storm is good. Let's do winter storm. And it, it, just, it just lasts. It just lasts and lasts and lasts. So I've got the Winter Storm, which it's a very interesting color. It has greens and blues and blacks. 
It kind of bops around with a little bit of all that in there. So if you fire it and it's not bright enough, can you add another layer and refire it? You can, but it might not be brighter because those colors that are underneath it are already dulled and you're putting a little bit brighter, one little bit brighter layer on top of a bunch of dull layers, it's going to get like maybe a third brighter. Do you see? It's a, yeah, it's disappointing when that happens. And those are things that I don't know if like people talk about. They talk about the Celadons. You really should do cone five, not cone six with them. So this is the winter storm. We know all about winter storms here in Vermont. All right, so I'm only going to put this on the, you know what? Let's put it inside the area where the cord goes. And this is the teardrop pendant that will be out Friday. You can learn how to make these, but you got to wait till Friday. I can't tell you today. I'm not going to tell you how to make them. It's a big old secret. But, but Friday it won't be. It's going to be out on the app and on the website. Is my necklace hitting the mic? No, my necklace isn't. My necklace is like super high. It stops here. My mic is down. My mic's actually right over here, guys. It could be the hair. You know, if I cut it all off, it'll be because it was in the way of the mic. No, I'm just going to put it back. All right, back to the obsidian. We did one coat. Let's do our second coat. And this is going to be a lighter coat. because I don't want to lose the texture. All right, so we'll let that dry. I can clean off my brush. To clean these brushes, and really to clean any brush, you know, when you're done with it, you swish it out, and then squeeze the bristles, and you want to dry it upside down or at an angle, because if you don't, what happens is water gets back into the ferrule, and it breaks down the adhesive, the glue they use to make it, um, so all these, if you notice, these particular brushes have little loops. Put that up to the camera. Is that going to show? It has a loop. See the, see the loop? So they're made for hanging. Um, so you just like, you know, I can't get it on that nail. It's too big. Sorry. That one. There's some up there, but I can't reach them. Anyhow, you hang them somewhere. I'm going to have to do like a whole bunch of little nails here to hang. Oh, that's a great idea, isn't it? If I hang my brushes on the beam behind me in my barn, hmm, that's, hmm, hmm, that sounds like a fun thing to do. Libby thinks I sound fine. Thank you. I, I try not to be scratchy. All right, our pigment's on here. I'm going to wipe it off the back. You know, a little pigment on the back wiped away, it won't stick to your shelf, and it gives your shelf a little... A little something. It, it gives your, not yourself, the back of your, your pendant a little something. So we'll wipe this off the sides. And again, although we're wiping it back, it's soaked into the clay. It's stained the clay, so it's in there. And remember, you should wear gloves. This is very much do as I say, not as I do moment. And then we'll wipe down here. So I want the leaf part to really stand out. You see how we can really see that texture? Witness cones. Right, so I always, if you've watched my kiln openings and you've heard me talk about firing, I always use witness cones. That's how you know what temperature your kiln's going to. Without the witness cone, you do not have a true record of what your kiln got to temperature-wise. You know, the little readout might tell you one thing, but the actuality of heat work, which is temperature plus time, so you need to know the heat work and what happened in your kiln. It can actually be a cone 5 kiln that actually got hotter than a cone 6 kiln. What? Yes, if you don't have witness cones and your kiln fired to a programmed cone 5, it could be hotter than somebody who fired to cone 6. And I talk about that in why you should use your own pyrometric cones and how to make your own cone packs. So here's, look at that sweet little texture. Aww. 
I am going to do something a little different. I am going to use an Amoco Celadon Clays on four minutes. So how, does, how does this time go by so fast? I'm going to use the Aqua Celadon on the Interactive Pigment. I love Aqua Celadon. It is a beautiful aqua color. It is actually this color here. You all see this color? Isn't that beautiful? I'm going to use, I'm going to drop that pendant. That was, it survived. Oh my gosh, thank God, I just realized. This is my daughter's. This is the one I made for her. And she, she, I made a batch of pendants. She came out to the studio. She picked out her favorite. And I just dropped it. Good thing she doesn't watch my broadcasts. I'd be in so much trouble. You all don't have any idea. Well, if you have daughters, you have an idea. All right, so on top of that, we're just going to brush on the aqua glaze. And I will do two coats of the aqua, mm, maybe three. We'll see. And don't glaze the back. If you do happen to get glaze on the back, you're going to go ahead and wipe it off, unless you want to fire this on stilts, in which case, if you do that, glaze the back. All right, so imagine we put two more coats of the aqua on. So I've showed you different ways to glaze beads. I will fire these and we'll have glaze results. I will share them first Monday morning in Good Morning Clay Share for my premium members. You all, you all get everything first and then everybody else here will get to see it next Wednesday when we do our live broadcast next Wednesday at five o'clock. All right. Heart failure over dropping the pendant, yes. Especially when you make it for somebody else, right? Whew. All right, so my premium members, what are we doing next? Yeah, we're gonna make this lemon plate. And this is only for premium members of ClayShare. And if you're not a premium member of ClayShare yet, go to ClayShare.com, sign up for our free seven day trial. It's $9.99 a month. That's it, $9.99. It's been that price for four years. We have never raised our prices because we want to make ceramic learning affordable and fun, right? So not saying we won't eventually raise our prices because maybe, but right now it's not. So if you sign up, you get grandfathered in. How do you like that? So we're going to be making this. If you can't watch it live, don't worry. It'll be recorded and available as a replay later. So you all who are watching this on a replay that want to watch this as well, it'll be there. All right. That's what I got for you all. Check out the textured chunky bead class on clayshare.com. That's available today. Tomorrow, we're gonna be putting up the cannoli or roll up bead class. And then Friday, this one right here, the, te the, the teardrop pendant is going up. And we also have that new jewelry category full of other jewelry making classes if you wanna learn how to make your own ceramic jewelry. All right, everybody, take care, be well. And I will see you next week to make some more pottery here in the Clayshare studio. 